So what's at the top there? Agile fixed price contracts. Agile for co fixed price contracts. Oh, okay. There's a yeah. There's a lawyer in London that's working with my business partner, uh, Gabriel uh, Benefield. They've been working for over a year now, writing a book on agile contracts, and it's been very interesting talking to the lawyer because. He says lawyers look at contracts differently than you would in IT, and we have to have make the lawyers happy, even though they have a completely different agenda. But the fundamental basis of the contract is the money for nothing change for free. How many of you know already know that model? Most of you. So why do you still have questions? <laughs> What's the question? <laughs> How many are giving change for free in contracts today in here? No one, or only one. The strong recommendation is always give change for free. It's a really strong competitive advantage. It's very low risk. And for those of you who are, who are new to this, if you're going to do a fixed price contract, you have to be able to create a backlog for the whole contract. If you can't do that, you should not be in that business. You're going to have to fail. The thing about the Agile way of doing it is you don't have to estimate all of it in, in detail. You can use the way that you use Agile estimation, and that will cut the time of estimation radically. And at the, at the, the, the things that are most important at the front end, you probably do smaller pieces but as it gets further out, you're estimating bigger and bigger pieces. And using the point mechanism, it's extremely fast. At one telecom I work with, they found that, and they based this on real backlog that they'd implemented with Waterfall, and then they had workshops with Scrum estimation. They found that the Scrum estimation was 48 times faster than the Waterfall estimation and it gave either the same answer or a better answer. Okay, so agile estimation is extremely fast. The, the change for free model, for those of you who don't already know it, is that, uh, and this gets to the how does Scrum handle change, the Scrum backlog can change at any sprint boundary. So anytime a customer wants to put something in, they can add something, and all they need to do is throw away some, something that's very low priority that's of equal work. And Scrum doesn't care. It's fine. The contract doesn't change. And I know Trifork, I've seen some of the way they handle it. They have a little half-page addendum, and the customer signs off. We've changed this for that, and off they go. And at the end of the contract, maybe they have 150 of those half-page addendums. So they still have tight control of the contract. Change for free is tr tremendously valuable. For example, the example, the example I talked about today, uh, the CIO of O2 said, I just finished a $100 million contract. It cost me 270 million, 100 million euro contract. It cost me 270 million euro and was two years late. Can Scrum fix that? And I said, did you get change for free? And he said, no. I said, you paid $170 million for changes that you should have got for free. That's the problem. Scrum can fix that. But not afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> so change for free is easy. It should, you should implement that right away. It's very low risk. And it, will, it also uh, radically reduces the customer's risk of cost overrun. Now, how do you get them to cooperate? In the contract, you say they must evaluate the software at every sprint boundary. They can only introduce change at sprint boundaries. And they must you know, generally be good scrum citizens. If they're not, it goes back to time and materials. That's it. You already have that contract. They know what that is. 
So then they have an incentive to either behave or, it's, or they're going to pay more. So, so that's kind of where you would start. Now, if you're good, you can, you can do money for nothing. And money for nothing says there is, you know, CIOs typically rank contracts in order of return on investment. They have a way of calculating that. And below that, re below some cutoff, they will not do the project. Well, even within a project, there's a cutoff that exists where the value of the next feature is not worth the cost. You can't really see that up front, but you will see it if you're watching sprint to sprint. You'll all of a sudden the at the sprint reviews, the end users will say, "Oh, you know." That doesn't give me much value, and the, and the CIO always say, "Well, you know, we spent we spent a couple hundred thousand euro, euros for that. <laughs> it's no value. <laughs> we need to stop right now because everything coming further is even less value than that." And uh, so, money for nothing says you can terminate the contract at any time when you see that, and deploy. And the, the vendor gets some percentage of the remaining contract. Typically, I've seen 20 to 30 percent. And the customer sa saves the rest. The customer gets the remaining value. Now, the problem with this for the vendor is that you are taking on risk. The contract is capped at the fixed price. And if you can't deliver it as planned, you're going to pay for that. Now, on the other hand, the value to you, like one of the one of the, the biggest consulting I've seen, try to implement this with thousands of consultants. Uh, they charged a premium. They said, "Okay, if we're going to do this strategy, we're going to charge 30 percent more than our waterfall contracts because we're assuming risk. You know, you terminate, we may have people that are now unemployed." And customers, they found, are willing to pay that. They're willing to pay a premium. So they make 30% on the front end. Then if they finish early, they make 30% by any savings they can make. And then they are convinced, they, they usually do a small pilot up front to establish a velocity and an estimation practice that they and the customer both agree on. So they may do several sprints. You know, several two-week sprints, you know, six months to three months of a pilot to establish the basis of estimation. And then the customer wants to commit then for a longer term. And big companies like Deutsche Bank are tired of paying for 100 consultants time and materials forever. You know, they get a, they get a great proposal from a big consultancy. Maybe Valtech does this. <laughs> Law looks good. They got, their best, they got their best resumes in the proposal. And then what do they get? They get 100 kids right out of university. <laughs> and they're really slow, and it takes forever. And three years later, they still got 100 kids out of the university. <laughs> they're probably new kids. <laughs> and so they're tired of paying for that. <laughs> they, want to pay for, they want to establish a velocity. And then if the consultant organization puts people that are slow on it, they have to pay. Okay. But the consultancy that I mentioned, they're convinced that they can raise velocity at least 20 to 30 percent. They'll, they'll manage that velocity so they're getting paid by points. They're not getting paid hours. So if they can raise the velocity 20 to 30 percent, they can raise their effective uh, hourly rate by at least 20 to 30 percent. So they're making 30 percent three ways in this contract. And last time I've, I talked to them, they'd implemented about 20 of them. They had one or two failures where the customer got upset, things weren't working. But they said that was no worse, that was no worse than the waterfall failure rate. Right? And in one case, they were able to work their way out of it. In the other case, the customer threw them out. But at the end, they made 30% three ways on all the other ones. <laughs> so more successful than waterfall at lower cost, faster, happy customers. And so it gave them that what they want was marketing leverage to upset the balance of the Indian big waterfall companies. They want to disrupt the big Indian waterfall companies by using the strategy. 
So they made it, the CEO made it a strategic initiative for the company to execute on that. So this money for nothing change for free, you'll see if the book ever gets out, <laughs> you will see, you know, maybe a dozen different types of ways of thinking about contracts, but this model is at the core of all of them. And really it's all about how do you kind of take different strategies with different customers to actually execute on this. So for example, I've seen Trifork. <laughs> uh, they know that the waterfall vendors are bidding 4 million euro. They know they're bidding low and they're going to make it up on cost overruns, time and materials. But given that their competitors are pretty good at estimating waterfall, they know they can do it twice as fast with Scrum, so they don't even have to estimate. They just put the bid in at 4 million euro, give them change for free, get the, take the contract. <laughs> <laughs> Zero estimation. <laughs> no time. <laughs> they got the contract, you know, in, in Word. They just changed the names and boom. Of course, that's Trifork. They're really crazy like that. <laughs> so what else can I say about fixed price contracts? Michael would be because of that, I always call the fixed price environment, in fact, the natural environment for Scrum. Absolutely. You know, uh, the, the first team that really did this effectively had a $10 million contract, and they planned on 20 months, and they were going to be paid a half a million a month. They were doing monthly sprints. The customer terminated after three sprints. They said, our users are so happy, we got 80% of our of the value of a functionality, we want to deploy it. It was a big construction company. And uh, they got paid 1.5 million, plus 20% of the remaining 8.5 million, 1.7 million, they got 3.2 million. The customer got their software 17 months early and saved $7 million. Now, of course, the sales guys are upset about that. Now they've got consultants on the bench. But the management back at the office are saying, we thought we were going to get 15% margins and we got 60%. If we can execute every contract at 60% margins, we can sell this company for a ton of money. This is an early retirement strategy for the management. <laughs> <laughs> and what you find is that people that are able to do things, for example, Systematic and Denvik, a competitor to Trifork, is a CMI maturity level five company, and they bid all their scrum projects at half price of the waterfall. And of course, nobody wants to pay the waterfall price, so now all their projects are scrum. But what happened to their revenue? Their revenue almost doubled the first year they did this, because everybody wants, all of a sudden they got a ton more business, everybody wants the half price deal. So this is a huge threat to the big consultancies, and of course they need to—they're trying to figure out how to execute first before somebody does this to them. So I have a lot of people from Valtech and Accenture and training classes, Scrum training classes. I can only speak about U.S. No there. <laughs> okay, maybe we should go on to the yeah, next one. Let's say that was done. So Scrum prototyping. Or Change is going like if you have a a project that's not really so mature yet, you can say like the vision is clear and it's one of yeah. this we want to build and the product pipeline reflects that, or something in well, all direction actually still changes. Well, this is really interesting because um, my own company, Scrum Inc. You know, I mean, we do we do a lot of consulting and training. But I've said, we've got lots of partners like Trifork that will do consulting and, and training. So I'm not interested in building another training consulting company. You know, there's a hundred of them out there that will work with us and do it. So let's give them the business. 
my goal is to expand Scrum and, and also expand it outside IT. And since management is the biggest problem, drive it into the management structure. So we do things like work with the business school, the Harvard Business School. <coughs> so if that's the goal of the company, what should the business model be? Now, uh, you know, uh, our, our team, you know, was struggling to figure that out. So they went and found a guy, a practice manager at Boss Consulting Group, one of the leading consulting groups in the company that consults with companies on how to figure this out. And it turned out that he had been about 10 years at Boss Consulting, and they have a program for somebody that, you know, he's been traveling for 200 days a year for the last 10 years, and he wants to move to another job where he's more stable, no, tr not so much travel. And uh, Boston Consulting Group has a program for that, where if you want to do that, for six months to a year, you can work half time, you'll get your salary, and the other half time, you can look for a new job that is, is has less travel. But while you're looking, you can't take any money, otherwise you go off the payroll. So he came to work for us as a volunteer. <laughs> and, and we built a quadrant of, you know, some things are, you know, easy, and some things are hard, and some things make less money, and some things make more money. And let's get all everything in the you know, on the thing, and then we want to work on the things that are easy and make a lot of money, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, okay, so how do we prioritize them? Now, now we've got an ill-formed set of product initiatives that we're going to have to figure out what the market would be. So when I'm coaching the company now on, including the Boston Consulting Group manager, uh, is look at the Lean Startup book. Okay, Lean Startup is a big thing in the United States right now. I don't know if it's hit Europe, but it's a guy in Silicon Valley started this. He had run a number of companies in Silicon Valley, and he, some of them failed and some of them were successful. And so he figured out, okay, what's the model by which you would start out a new product offering when you don't know if people will buy it yet. And the basic thing is that, and he had done agile in companies, and some of them had failed and some of them had not failed. So what makes things work? Well, the basic thing is that you need to be agile in your product backlog development. And you need to test your concept very fast. So how fast can you get something out you know, I've seen some people put up a website and offer a product that doesn't exist. <laughs> Let's see what happens. <laughs> okay, that's maybe not the best strategy because, you know, you can turn off the market when you can't deliver it. But how can you very fast get a product up even though it's not complete, it's limited, and you start in, 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 a, in a limited space, start to get orders and see what will sell. And he has many examples in there of products that started out were a great idea. Uh, the the, great, the in, most interesting one is a instant messenger product that they were going to do for, with avatars. They thought people would really want instant messengers that had avatars, and they would needed to connect it to all the instant messenger systems so that they could, you know, everybody could move to this new avatar thing, but it would still go out on all the other IMs. And so they spent a lot of time doing this integration. They launch it and they find out nobody's interested in using this avatar for other IMs. And because they're not interested in using it for people that they're already IMing, you know, their, their current group. But they're really interested in using these avatar for people they never met. So he said, we spent a year building this integration. It's all waste. They pulled all that code out and threw it away. He said, I should have done this in three months. And he, he calls that a pivot. You've got to get 
something out quickly and then it either clearly works in a way that you can iterate on it or it's the wrong thing and then you have to take a sideways motion to some completely different thing. And your ability to execute that at the product, this is a product backlog agility mechanism. So, you know, he worked with Agile and Scrum in the software development side, but he found that unless you get the product backlog right, it doesn't work. So he came up with the, these ideas he calls Lean Startup on how to make the product backlog agile. So for that problem, I would look to Lean Startup. And he's written, I think it's Eric Rees' name, he's written a really great book about it. Isn't this how Scrum is meant to work? Yes, but you know, we haven't, if you look at the Scrum <laughs> guide, it says you gotta have a product owner, and these are his responsibilities. But it doesn't go into a lot of detail on how a product owner should execute in the market. It just says he needs to have a vision, he needs to have a business plan, he needs to prioritize things right to execute on that plan. Okay, well, <laughs> what Eric is saying, okay, executing requires a little bit more, you know, machinery around it in a, in a startup environment to be successful. It's not that the scrum part isn't right, but we need to put some parameters around how, that. How, do, how is the product owner inspecting and adapting and adjusting and so forth? And he has lots of cool examples about. So that's one example of trying to navigate into a new market. Let's say you already have a market. One of the most interesting things I've seen recently was the uh, Norwegian post office. The, the Norwegian post office, I think, I think I was trying to remember the number of companies they bought. They buy companies that ship stuff. And I think they bought a couple of dozen of them. And so then they, they'll ship anything, you know? <laughs> Not just a letter, but it will, you know, it'll ship hardware, you know, it'll ship, you know, construction vehicles. It might even ship houses, you know? <laughs> you want to move, move a house from Zurich out into, down to Zug, you know? How would you ship the house down there? I mean, they, they, anything that ships anything, the Norwegian post office thinks that's their business. <laughs> <laughs> so now they have a website, <laughs> and you log in, and you've got, <laughs> you know, I want to ship my motorcycle. Okay, how do I find out the price on that website? And it takes, you know, it took an average of four minutes to figure out you know, where the place was that I could possibly ship a motorcycle and how much it would cost, and to click, you know, order the motorcycle ship. And they said, that's too slow, and it needs to be 45 seconds or less. So they actually went out and hired an external consultant who was an expert, and it turned out to be Tom Gild's sub. Maybe of you know, some of you know Tom Gild. And he came in and he said, geez, you know, we need to use the team to help innovate around this. I know what the business goal is, 45 seconds to click submit order. <laughs> but I have no idea on how to make this website get there the best way. But I think the development team might be able to figure it out. So he went to the development team and he said, I want eight different ways to cut four minutes down to something much less than four minutes. And I want you in the next sprint to give me eight prototypes that show that. So he's essentially executing what Apple does constantly. They always have, they have, usually have a dozen fully working prototypes before they will ever go into implementation or product. And they came back at the end of the sprint with these eight prototypes and he said, okay, now let's sit down Let's look at what's the business value of each prototype, how much does it help us, and what would it cost to implement. He has the development team estimate, you know, rolling out this particular version, and then he makes a decision on which prototype to implement. Then he tries to do it fast and get it up and see if he gets some results. And based on the results, then he iterates again, so he's into the lean startup mode. Okay, so this is all Agile product manager stuff. Uh, we have a certified product owner course 
And uh, my product owner at Scrum Inc. says they all, they all need to be better than that because they don't teach this kind of agile thinking. So we're probably going to write one that you know, helps take people through all these different strategies on how to deal with stuff. I think the, uh, there was another uh, question about change that I don't think is part of that. And that was, you know, suppose something, some stuff comes into the sprint. The customer wants stuff, bugs, defects. Was that another piece of that? Um, sorry, that was my question. Um, yeah, because uh, sometimes there are changes, mainly when, the, when the, the client is not very sure about the, the product, even after the prototype. Um, Sometimes there are changes which are critical and involve touching the architecture, right. and very big changes. So that will change also the cost of the project. Probably the right. schedule will will be will have to be extended or will have to compromise other things. So how is is the how is this handled? Is the the, the product owner deciding on that? On well, the, the the product owner is responsible for ordering the backlog and then delivering that to the scrum team. And the scrum team doesn't care what they're delivering as long as it doesn't change inside the sprint. Mm -hmm. Now, on the other hand, they're going to have to have to estimate things. So if the product owner says, OK, we need this change, the development team is going to say, well, in product grooming sessions, the product owner will be working with the team. OK, it looks like this is what's going to have to happen. The development is going to see, oh, it's going to take this whole change, architectural change. And the product owner is going to say, what's that going to cost? And the developer is going to estimate that. Now the product owner is going to have to figure out what to do, how to manage the customer. So then it's between the product owner and the customer. Yeah. Now the product owner has the team as a collaborator in figuring out the cost trade-offs. Mm -hmm. um, now the team is also spending time doing estimates which were not forecasted. Or the team, you know, the recommendation, we haven't talked this about this in the class yet, but the recommendation is to give 10% of the team's time to the product owner for the purpose of estimating backlog. Whatever backlog the product owner wants to estimate it. Yeah. So when one guy of the team has a great ID and wants the product owner to, to say yes to a prototype, then you need some kind of influence in the product owner to... to well, right. That. Well, the, the, the rule with the product backlog is anybody could put anything on the product backlog. So if a developer has a great idea, he should put it on the product backlog. Now the product owner is going to prioritize it. Now, now the product owner is going to say when the product grooming session, OK, what's in it for me? And the product owner is going to have to, OK, here's, here's the business case for that. You know, where's the business case? Scrum is intentionally set up that. Way so you, the product owner is always asking, "What's the business case?" So and should be and together with the team should come up with the consequences. If you're really making the dark changes all the time, it really means you're creating waste because yeah, you're yeah. throwing away whatever you did before. That needs right. to be clear for the customer. Even worse, in my opinion, is the internal customer. So when because uh, because the external customer is really worried about this money, but the internal customers they think they can they can change change change. No? And there, it's, it's, very, it's, it's the obligation of the team to come up and show what are the consequences. Right. The team shows the consequences, and the product owner is responsible for the revenue stream. So if the product owner is not delivering on the revenue, the company is going to find a new product owner. <laughs> yeah. Because the risk starts if you have no, no powerful product owners that knows about this and follow only things that the business wants and makes a, the team crazy going. Yeah, going. right. And say, okay, is this direction, is this direction? There is, this yeah, uh, there is a really, when we work with the venture teams on training product owners, it's really important. Uh, we talk about John Boyd's book. Uh, John Boyd was a fighter pilot that trained the military and then started going to business, training them on the OODA loop. Has anybody heard about the OODA loop? It's a variation of the PDA cycle, but it's different. And OODA stands for observe. OK, in a fighter, you observe. Things are changing very fast. And based on what you're seeing, you have to orient yourself. And then you have to decide what you're going to do and then act. And the challenge in the, 
in the fighter world is to get the decision time so short that you just observe, orient, and you're already acting. So somebody's on your tail, you see that, you're oriented, and then whoom, all of a sudden you're behind him. And John Boyd was the only fighter pilot that anybody knows that never lost an air-to-air -air battle in combat or in peacetime. 100%, he was like Musashi, the greatest swordsman that ever lived in Japan, never lost a battle. And so we have to train the, our product owners in the OODA loop. And that requires a, a very tight coupling of the product owner with the team and the scrum master. So the product owner is thinking, maybe we ought to go this way. The team is already in motion. If the team feels that the product owner doesn't know what they're doing, or he's confused, or he's changing too much, it breaks the trust and the bond and destroys the capability, OK? So we really work with our venture companies, and put, with the product owners, to try to get them you know, really clear about they be, need to be able to move fast. The team has to develop total confidence in them. And they need to not do anything that's going to violate that coupling. If they do, the team doesn't trust them. If they're not telling the truth, if they don't know what they're doing, the team will not follow. If the team will not follow, we can't win in the market. So how to get that in your product owners? You know, if you're, if you're a big bank in Zurich, you've got a big problem, because <laughs> they don't think that way. <laughs> so you just have to do the best you can, you know, knowing that there's going to be problems if it's not done right. I think. Um the second uh, role is the scrum master, and the scrum master has to change the product on his right direction. Yes. Make sure that he knows what he's doing. Right. The scrum master is responsible for the process and implementing the process, and that includes training the product owner. Every company I've been in, is, you know, since 1993, I've done nothing but scrum. I think I'm in the seventh scrum company, and every single company I've had to not only train the product owner, but actually set up the product owner group because usually you wind up with a whole group and I've had to train the CEO and the VP of marketing I want the product owner team and marketing I have to train them all I have to train the product owners and then I have to train the team to support them that's the scrum master's job as best you can you know product owner is part of the team in my opinion yes and, and many 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 people because of the product management background keep that Apart. Yeah. 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 yeah, the product owner role is half the time with the customer and half the time with the team, working with the team, helping explain what is needed from the customer. So they're part of the team, and the customer is embedded in the team. And if they're doing that, then they're ripping, them, ripping the product owner out of the team, and it's going to cause a mess. Should we go to the next one? Uh, so now, now it's Jeff has actually also been a fighter pilot in North Vietnam. So, so, so you're telling us you actually, uh, you actually lost fights? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was in reconnaissance, so. Okay. Good. Good save. <laughs> next one is one front backlog, multiple teams. Like yeah. starting points, usually only like, go for one team. So you know, there's a number of examples on this. You know, Microsoft has 3,000 developers working on Visual Studio products, and they they have to deal with this. Maybe the simplest example is Citrix Online. They implemented Scrum. Um, they have dozens of teams, and They've, the Scrum started to help them, but very quickly they realized they needed to manage the backlog at the enterprise level. So they have, they have multiple products, and they have a product management group, and a project, product manager to them owns a product. Like, there's a product manager that owns GoToMeeting. There's another one that owns GoToMyPC. And to implement those products, 
there are multiple product owners involved in implementing those products. So at the enterprise level, they need the product manager to propose a new release. It might be a new product, it might be a current product with more features. And to do that, they ask them to initially come up with their best guess of, you know, what's the cost revenue trade-off. And if that looks good, they then tell them, okay, get with the product owners and the scrum masters and give us a, a better estimate of the cost. They then come back again with a refined plan. If it still looks good, they said, okay, go back to the, go back, identify the teams that would implement this if we were to do it, and get the teams to do a real point estimate of the backlog. And come back up with, come back to us with essentially a fixed price contract that's fully estimated by the teams that would implement, and then we'll make a decision. On the basis of that, then all their projects are prioritized. They have a product backlog of projects. That's, and they do net present value calculations to, to, you, to, to prioritize them. And then they start staffing at the top. And they staff as many as they can. They're always driving the top one to closure as fast as possible. So if it runs into trouble, they will cannibalize lower priority projects. To, they're always trying to drive that first one to closure as fast as possible. So using that strategy, they drove their time to delivery of a new release from, it was approaching four years, they've driven it down to less than they were when they were a startup, averaging about five months. And uh, as a result of that, their market share has now moved up past Microsoft they're now number two, and now they're gunning for Cisco, which is the number one vendor with WebEx. Um, uh, and it's all been driven by this enterprise level management of the backlog. So that's how they do it. Uh, let me just say, if you have a small, uh, maybe not the small, but you know, the high performing scrum teams can do a lot. So it may be a pretty big product if you have six scrum teams even. <clears throat> but if it's a common code base, I like one backlog and then the teams figure out how to distribute it. That will make it go faster. Once they distribute it, you need a mechanism for cross sharing of backlog during the sprint. They need to self-organize across teams. And there's various ways of doing that, and uh, some are really effective. Uh, at, at Patient Keeper, we, we, the, the policy was anybody could take any task in a sprint and give it to anybody on any team. And we had, in our tooling, we had built special tooling on top of JIRA so that every developer had a little workflow window that they could see what was on their list of stuff that they were, they were going to be working on. And if I assign it to Hans, okay, I put Hans on there, all of a sudden Hans is looking, whoa, where did this come from? It's got to be done by the end of the week, or at least at the end of the week. So Hans has a choice by the rule. He can either take it or send it to someone else. <laughs> really? So Hans then sends it to Sally <laughs> on another team. <laughs> and Sally looks at this and she says, I can't do this. There's a stopping rule. The third person, Sally, has to call a meeting of three people and they have to decide together how this is going to get done. That works really well because 80% of the time people don't want to have to have a meeting. <laughs> and they just take it. <laughs> and it causes dynamic load balancing across teams. Yeah. That's, that triggers an interesting variation of musical chairs. You put one more task than players and then see what happens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that really worked well. Uh, but, you know, some people would just, I know some, I mean, Nokia and uh, Siemens Networks in China, they just tell the teams, you must self organize to get this stuff done. If you don't, we're going to hold individual developers accountable that should have self organized. You had this, you didn't do it, and you didn't get help. 
you're going to have a, it's going to be very bad for you at the end of a sprint. <laughs> and conversely, the person you asked for help didn't help you, it's going to be bad for the two of you. <laughs> We're going to have a big conversation about this. So they let, they let the teams figure out how to handle it. Okay. Um, we running out of time? Yeah, kind of. I think we take this question and end it there. And that is. The team only accept ready stores. Like, how do you. How the team to actually say no to non ready stories? Everybody know what I mean by ready? A story that's ready? Only five stories. Everybody on the team understands what it is about. We've estimated it. <coughs> made, if not defined tasks for it. But shouldn't be, there shouldn't be uh, acceptance criterias, uh, criteria. Um, when the sprint starts, and that's the kind of, you've taken that kind of story into the sprint, the sprint shouldn't start with, what the hell, the hell do I do with this story? Yeah. The, the first thing you need to do is, is get clear to everybody, and you can do that with some historical data, on what does ready mean, and then show that stories that are ready go through the sprint twice as fast as those that aren't. So then at the management level, it's a choice. Do you want stuff twice as fast or you want to just ship crap into the sprint like you're doing now? now if you have a good product, though, they will help. For example, this, and this will hit actually one of the other questions. There was a $3 billion company in uh, the United States that a healthcare company and they had uh, about a dozen business units and a single IT group that supported all the business units with new applications, help desk, everything. And they had a ticketing system. They were doing about 1,000 tickets a week. And the CIO thought Scrum could help with this. So he hired a good Scrum coach in to help him implement Scrum. The first thing the Scrum coach did was say, OK, there's no product owner of this backlog coming in from all these business units. And there's a lot of stuff that doesn't have all the information needed to execute on. And that's causing a huge amount of dysfunction in the teams. So I'm going to move in. and I'm the chief product owner now. And my first decision is that any business unit that puts a backlog item in that doesn't have the support from the business unit needed to make it immediately executable goes to the bottom of the priority list. In two weeks, he went from 1,000 tickets to 2,000 tickets. And the senior management was complaining in the, in the management meeting to the CEO, we're not getting our backlog done. And the CEO looks, we were doing 1,000 tickets, and we're now doing 2,000. And it's because you're trying to feed crap into their backlog, and they're refusing. I think you need to straighten up as a manager. Because the CEO had the data to make that decision. So. That's a simple uh, example of how getting ready backlog will double your throughput. Now, what is ready? Uh, there's a good presentation on high productive metrics on my website that Scott Downey and I have worked on. And we train the Scrum Masters to never take something in that's not ready. And not ready, we use a variation of the INVEST acronym. I means immediately actionable. If you can't do this immediately in this sprint, do not take it. It needs to be negotiable under discussion with the product owner. How are we going to do it? There needs to be a discussion. There needs to be understanding of it. Uh, it needs to be value. If there's not a clear value statement from the product owner that's understood by the developers, don't take it. Uh, it needs to be estimable. If you can't estimate, do not take it. It needs to be sized properly. And if you have historical data, you know, uh, OK, let's, for 13 point stories, how many of those get through sprints successfully? Oh, 15%. OK, we're not going to take any of those anymore. <laughs> you have the data to make decisions. If story, you want the stories that have an 80% probability of getting through the sprint. Maybe they can only be three points to get, to get that. So that's all you take. And finally, testable. There need to be clear acceptance tests that determine 
done. And if that is not the case, the Scrum Master does not allow it into the sprint. Now, to do that, you have to empower the Scrum Master. So there needs to be you know, probably some data at the management level showing them the effect of putting crap into the sprint. And you need some management commitment to support. That's typically what I do, particularly with venture companies. I usually sit down with the management and I say, how do you feel about your development teams? You know, they failed the last five sprints. And they say, we feel terrible. We think they should be doing more. We're not, customers are screaming. And then I say, well, do you want to live that way forever? I, said, I say, because you're going to change. It's going to cost you. If you're not willing to change, you're going to have to suck forever. And then they say, well, tell us what we would have to do. <laughs> we'll see if we'd like it. <laughs> I say, well, in this case, you're going to have to empower the Scrum Master. And they say, well, you know, we don't know. How to, they, they start, you know, they whine and they argue. And, they, and I just say, if you continue whining and arguing with me, your teams are going to suck forever. And it's your response. It's your fault. And if you're going to fix this, you're going to have to change things and put some strong things in place. So either yes or no. Now, fortunately, since I work for the venture group, <laughs> you know, I'm going to go back and talk to the investors. <laughs> so they will usually cave. <laughs> and I said, OK, that's what we're going to implement. And for things like that, the, the velocity of the development teams will immediately accelerate. So they'll get immediate positive feedback. And there's several things like that that are just kind of so basic that you just have to work with the management long enough to get them committed to support the Scrum. Is that enough? I think so. But, uh, you guys want to stay? Maybe we can talk to Jeff into doing one more question. You rather want to go for beers. <laughs> How many people want to go for beers? No? How many people want to stay? <laughs> okay. Well, do you raise your hand for the states? Or do you want to <laughs> I'm, I'm open to what they okay. like. Waterfall, how do you get from Waterfall to Trump? There are many projects I've been in on where they've got a big project and they decided to do it. You know, the waterfall plan has come out. <laughs> Let me give you an example. Uh, uh, Medco is a great example because I think it was back in 2007. In July of 2007, the CEO of Medco, Medco was a $55 billion company. That was its turnover and it had 5,000 developers. And they, they deliver uh, medications by mail order. They have robotic factories to fill the prescriptions. And so because they can do it uh, so cheaply, people want to buy their medications from Medco. So the CIO said, we're going to, you know, we're number one and we're going to stay number one. The way we're going to do it is we're going to have, we're going to change our IT structure so that we can take specialized patient groups. You know, anybody who has lung disease, we're going to send their medications to a special pharmacy, pharmacy group that are experts in lung disease. They're going to optimize their medications, lower the cost, and improve the healthcare outcome. Same thing for cancer. Same thing for diabetes. Same thing for every major thing. But to do that, you know, we have this big IT pipe now that takes millions of prescriptions every week, and we're going to have to break that into multiple tracks. It's going to be a big project, but in one year, it's going to be done. And he goes to Wall Street and announced to all the investment bankers that you can count on this. They're a publicly traded company. He then puts the waterfall team to work, and on 1 December, they have the plan, and it says 1 July 2009. 
And they talk about it, they said the last project they had like this that was Waterfall was two years late. So <laughs> it's somewhere between 1 July 2009 and 1 July 2011. And the CEO says, he says to the chief financial officer, what will happen to our stock price? The CFO says, well, it might go down 10%. <laughs> we can't have that, he says. So we're going we're gonna to have a project leader for this. And he appoints an executive vice president and four heads of business units, vice presidents who are running business units, as the product owner team. And their job is to bring this in in July of 2008. So in December, they're meeting, <laughs> saying, what the hell are we going to do? You know, we've got a project that's at least a, half, a year and a half out. It's going to be delivered in six months. And the CTO says, scrum. And they said, well, we don't know what scrum is, but you better bring a team in here that stays here until July and delivers this with our people. And you better do it right now, because we, we're, we're, we're out of time, we're out of options. So he calls me just before Christmas, like the day before Christmas. He says, you've got to show up with a team on 2 January <laughs> that's going to deliver this project for us. He and I had worked together at a different company. So I show up, and they have hundreds and hundreds of pages of waterfall documentation. This is very common. Yes. And so what we usually do is in the documentation, they usually have Excel spreadsheets. So we, we pull the Excel spreadsheets out, and we run them through mail merge. You know, every, every row has a feature. We run them through mail merge, and we generate cards. And then we take a room like this, and we start putting the cards around the wall. And, uh, and you know, we look at the cards. We have to break them out, have more cards. We have to order them, prioritize them. And then we need to get the development team in to estimate them. It took us a week. The product on the team was 15 to 20 people. And then the, we, uh, we bring the development team in periodically to do estimation. And at the end of a week, we had a room like this with six lanes. There were going to be six teams around three walls. And the developer and development team estimated 1,000 points. So this was by 15 January we had that. And then the, I had to come to Europe to do some training for Trifork or something. <laughs> so, so the product owner team said, Sutherland, get in here. We need to meet with you and the team. And we need to know, we need to know where you are. So we go into the meeting. And the first thing, the first statement is from the executive vice president, are you going to meet the date? What's the answer to that? Yes. No! <laughs> Scrum is about truth, transparency, and trust. <laughs> Guys have been spending too much time in India, right? <laughs> the answer is the truth. I have no idea whether your teams can meet your date, but I guarantee we'll beat your waterfall date. And if we don't, you get all your money back. And uh, that was going to be hundreds of thousands of dollars. <laughs> I was committing myself and partners. Uh, he says, that's not good enough. You need to meet the date. <laughs> Is this? Is this come up? So, so what do you do in Scrum then? You say you did something usable at that date. Well, we already, we already had the priority backlog. We already had it estimated. I said, we're going to run three sprints, and we're going to determine the velocity of these six teams. And at the end of those three sprints, it'll be one March. We're going to give you a date. And I said, it's going to be a date that you won't like. Along with the date that you don't like, we're going to give you an impediment list. It'll be prioritize the biggest problems you have in your company. And your job as a management team will be to make them go away. Not analyze them, not discuss them, but make them disappear. And at this point, the executive vice president says, Jeff, I used to work with, for Toyota. No problem. 
I said, yes, we're going to have a good, successful project. I was excited to hear that. <laughs> that was the end of the meeting. So on one March, we delivered them the date. I think we gave them one December. And we said, you know, in order for your teams to meet July, they have to double their velocity. And here's the top 12 impediments in priority order that the teams can't fix themselves. They're problems with the company. How long do you think it took, think it took for a guy that used to work from Toyota to remove all those impediments? Three months. Four days. <laughs> They really taught me a lesson. There is no impediment in your company that has to last for more than a week if you've got a guy from Toyota in charge. <laughs> it's just the way it is. So the only reason you have them is your company just wants to hold on to them. They can't give them up. Now, during this time, the, the, at the end of the first sprint, the team had delivered a velocity of 20. Then they went to 40. Then they went to 60. So by 1 March, they were down to 880 points. Their release burn down looked like this. And then they removed those, those impediments immediately. And within that very same sprint, they went up to 90. So at the end of that sprint, we said, you know, the date now looks like 1 September. And we need 1 July. We have this gap. What are we going to do? <clears throat> What's that? Throw away crap. Throw away crap. Well, we started executing the scrum, what I call the scrum emergency procedure, which is number one, can you do something different? You know, you're two points behind in the World Cup and there's two minutes left of the game. You're not going to take stuff out of your backlog. You're going to need those two points. <laughs> okay. So you're going to have to do something different than you've been doing, you know, and okay, maybe remove some impediments that haven't been removed. So we, we asked the development team, is there anything we could do that would make you go faster? in terms of removing impediments. And they said, oh yeah, you know, a third of our team is in India. And during the last sprint, the IT group shut down a port on the internet for security reasons. And none of the Indians guys could get access to ClearCase where all the code is put. <laughs> so the velocity of third of the Indian teams was zero. Kind of sounds like UBS Bank, right? Does anybody here work for UBS? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, do you think you could fix that in the next sprint? And they said, yeah, yeah, we, that we, if, if it's really important, yeah, all we have to do is tell the, the project management team that this has got to be fixed, and they'll fix the IT group. So, okay, we figured out that that would get us about a third of the gap closed. And the second thing is, can we get any help? You know, and usually that means offloading backlog, not adding people, but off can we get anybody else to do some of this? And we talked about that for a while and we decided we were going to need to go to the management team to discuss this. So before we did that, let's look at step three. Can we reduce backlog? And the product manager said, no, 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 we can't do that. We're already, you know, we've we've you know, we've, we're down to the bone, you know, we've got all the fat, we're down to the bone. We said, okay, we need to take a piece of bone then. <laughs> <laughs> it took us about half a day, of, but we, we got another third. We still had a gap. We said, okay, now let's, let's meet with the management team. And uh, when in, we talked about, we shared the problem with them. Here's the challenge. And they said, well, you know, we probably shouldn't deploy this to the whole company. But maybe a third of the company on the initial rollout would be reasonable. And if we chose that third correctly, we could probably eliminate a little more backlog. So it was actually a very short meeting. We just uh, eliminated that third, and we declared victory. And this was in 
This must have been, uh, you know, by, by the end of March, by 1 April. And the management team said, you know, call us if you need help. We never called them. It came in on time. And the stock price had a nice uptick. I said to those guys, you know, this is a billion dollar project. You're not paying me anything. And uh, if you look at their stock price, it upticked on this. Then, of course, they had, they had all the challenges of rolling it out across the company, and the stock price kind of went down a little bit. But then it went, started back up, and they've, they've doubled the stock price of the company since this project. So it did leverage them. They're now an $80 billion company, and they have 8,000 developers. So. And now, no. okay, the CIO <coughs> brought us in and he said, <clears throat> you know, he said, I went to your sprint review of your team. This was actually uh, when we're still in the middle of this, uh, around April. And he said, those people were on fire. He said, I want to know how we can get the other 4,950 people <laughs> on fire like that. <laughs> And then uh, we told them, what you, you know, you need to implement Scrum, and here's what you need to do. And so they thought about it for a while. You know, they thought about it for a few weeks. And they got back to us, and they said, we don't think we can implement Scrum. The culture is, uh, the cultural barriers are too high. We can do it with you here, but without you here, we can't do it now. So we've kept in touch with them. Meanwhile, the CTO's biggest problem is he has all these mainframe guys who take forever to deliver anything. And his goal was to get them on a release cycle, a one-month release cycle with a service-oriented architecture where they could update the APIs every month. And it took him three years to get them there. But as he's getting them here, he's calling me, okay, Jeff, I want to roll out Scrum everywhere. How should we set up the space? I sent him, I sent him lots of information about how Microsoft does it. And I just talked to him about a month ago, and he's got Scrum now deployed for all new development, and he's going to roll it out across that whole company. So for big companies, sometimes it takes a few years to get things in order, and it takes a really strong person at the, you know, in the engineering management to drive it. Uh, but, you know, Medco is just a great example. Uh, the guy, the CTO is brilliant. I, could, I was amazed not only what he had done with Scrum, but technically he's implemented the technology in there that is really leading, <coughs> leading the state of the art. He can adjudicate a claim in a nanosecond with, with tens of millions of customers. because of the database technology and strategies he's implemented. So those of you who know big insurance companies and stuff like that, how many insurance companies can adjudicate a claim in a nanosecond? <laughs> so it isn't just Scrum. They have a real visionary that's rolling this out. OK, I think we should have beer now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.